Right, let's move on to Bukhari Gate. Bismillah. Right, folks, so what's been going on? Just to give a backdrop, we've had a whole... Um, there's been quite a bit of a stir. Uh, I've began a discussion. Now, let me just highlight that this discussion did not begin with me. This discussion is actually very widespread and it's very common in uh, the Arabic speaking world and in other languages. So people have been having these discussions. Um, people even in Urdu have been having these discussions. People I mentioned before, uh, you know, Allama, uh, uh, what is it, Said Multani Saab. I mentioned other people, their books, uh, critiquing Bukhari massively. I mean, really shockingly critiquing it you know his i mentioned his urdu book quran e muqaddas or bukhari e muhaddas the uh the quran which is uh revelation and bukhari which is an innovation um and his his whole thing kind of tears bukhari to pieces but in the arab world as well people have been having many discussions on this there's tv shows chat shows it's all over the internet it's all over youtube this is nothing new that i've come up with but yes people who are not privy to that um they may feel that this is uh like to them wow like mufti abu Layth has come up with this matter and i haven't and yes it is true that more so um apart from in india pakistan in those parts of the world the people who have taken this up like i mentioned allama multani saab and these other people they are actual scholars great scholars of hadith but uh but in in parts of the arab world many people have taken this up that are not necessarily traditionally trained scholars so they are like academics and from universities and there are some who are scholars as well like from al-azhar and other places but they're there are many people who are just academics. So sometimes when they take this up, they will say things like just dismiss everything. They will just throw everything and they won't be that thorough in their kind of research and stuff because they're not that trained from an Islamic perspective like uh, Islam Bahiri or Bahiri. I'm, I think it's Bahiri he pronounces it. The Egyptian kind of who's been having debates on this for I think maybe about two years now. Um, I think he was locked up in Egypt as well until uh, CC pardoned him. Uh, but this whole thing, he's been going at Bukhari and, and as have many other people, but I don't necessarily agree with his approach per se, because he, I, unless I've misunderstood him, because his approach is that the whole Islamic heritage is just garbage. Like his, his words were like the whole thing is garbage, not just these, uh, you know, that they're dubious or suspicious or they've got some rubbish in their midst, but that the whole thing is garbage. And... And obviously, I, you know, I don't agree with that. I am part of this tradition. I myself, just to clarify for people, have actually studied Sahil Bukhari from cover to cover. Uh, I've been taught, I've studied the sacred sciences. I've graduated as a scholar, as an alim of this deen. I have a connected chain going back through Farabri, <laughs> through Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri to Imam Bukhari. I have a chain going back to Imam Malik, to Abu Dawood, to Imam Tirmidhi. Unlike a lot of these scholars who got onto this discussion and are not actually trained in this, I am actually trained in this. I have studied these books cover to cover, tafaqquhan, okay? So we've actually studied them with understanding and with fiqh and things like this. And then I went on to do my Mufti Iftar course after that for, a, you know, um, to graduate as a Mufti as well. So I'm, it's not that I'm not part of this tradition. I am part of this tradition. And it's not that I'm not trained in these books. I am trained in these books. And unlike these people, I've actually read these books cover to cover. And that doesn't mean I necessarily remember everything. I'm not going to make such a grand claim. But the truth is I have studied these cover to cover. Every, you know, the whole, all of these major books of Hadith. So, right. <laughs> And that's with, I mean, in class, I don't just mean I studied them as in sat, sat at home and studied them, but in class. And then we were tested three times throughout the year and gained top positions in the entire class in my uh, uh, Dora Hadith, in my study of uh, the books of Hadith. So, so, I mean, just to kind of clarify, it's not that I don't speak from a position of ignorance 
okay because some people might think look he looks modern and you know therefore he's trying to boycott our tradition i'm not trying to boycott our tradition but i feel w i am a part of that tradition right so um i mean as much as you guys would like me to uh, like to kick me out of it but <laughs> quite frankly my dear i outrank most of you <laughs> Okay, so the thing is, uh, but coming back to this thing that it's not, you see, it's not that I'm trying to get rid of this stuff, but I, I feel that we need transparency. We need to be honest because we are in an age of information. It's, you know, covering up things isn't going to cut it anymore because you can cover them up. But believe me. Other people know this discussion is wild in Arabic. It's it's actually very out there. So uh, I was the uh, just last week I was with my hairdresser <laughs> and he's Kurdish, uh, Iraqi Kurdish, and he was showing me in Kurdish all these discussions going on with the t uh, on their TV shows, and he was showing me. Obviously, I don't understand Kurdish, but he was telling me this is what the guys is become popular and he's debating this. And, these things are very, I mean, they are prevalent. So it's not just me. I've been contacted by scholars to keep this kind of private. They've asked me, you know, would you not discuss this? So somehow we could kind of retain. I'm like, look, <laughs> guys, stop this hide censorship, this culture of censorship. Be transparent. Be honest. Look, this deen does not become any diminished by Bukhari having some, have you know, being questioned. So now I'd like to get to the point is why am I doing this? Okay. First of all, there's three things I'd like to highlight. One is that Bukhari has been given a divine status. Whether we agree with this or not, whether you agree with this statement or not, that is a reality. That people why are they so upset that i'm criticized and the proof is in the pudding why are people so upset that i'm criticizing bukhari let's say i was criticizing uh let's say this this book right here ibn majah this one right behind me i was criticizing ibn majah nobody would bat an eyelid that's a, is that not a hadith book it is was he not a great scholar of hadith he was but nobody would care they don't care about ibn majah Let's say I was critiquing the book, the Sunan of Sa'id ibn Mansur. Nobody would care. It's because Bukhari has that kind of semi-divine status. Now, people don't say this, but it is the de facto rule. Like in, in the real world, Muslim real world, Bukhari is treated on, a, it is on par with the Quran. That is just the reality. That Unfortunately, due to the last 100 years of propaganda, people have pushed Bukhari up there with the Quran. In theory, they will say no. And some Salafis will say yes. Uh, some Salafis believe Bukhari is qat'i. It is maqtu'. That means it is certainty. It's like mutawatir and it's so widespread. And it is, the, you know, so th to them, it is technically on par with the Quran. Uh, but to most of the people, in theory, they will say it's just slightly below the Quran. Or they'll say it's below the Quran, but in reality, it's actually just up there. And I would argue it's actually above the Quran. Because they will never dismiss a problematic hadith in Bukhari because it clashes with the Quran. But they will dismiss a verse of the Quran if it clashes with Sahil Bukhari. So you tell me, like, look, how many verses are there in the Quran? Will you force people until they are believers? There is no co coercion in, in the faith altogether. You are not one to kind of uh, force people. Who wishes, let them believe. Who wishes, let them disbelieve. All of these things are verses of the Quran. Yet, when they have one hadith, in Bukhari through a problematic narrator, Ikrama, who was a extremist of his age. He was Khawarij. He was the father of, of ISIS. And these people, you, they would butcher people, right? Him, 
transmitting a hadith that Sayyidina Ali an said kill people. And by the way, the Khawarij hated Ali. So him saying that Ali said you should kill somebody for changing his faith. Now they and who said that the Prophet said this, they will leave all those verses of the Quran. So you tell me in practice which one is above. Am I lying? Yet when you look at Imam Shatabi, you look at these great scholars, they say no. They say the Quran always takes precedence. But these guys seem to have flooded us with all this propaganda. Now we've got Bukhari. So that's the first thing. This is my huge problem, this divine status. I want this gone. I will never, ever accept that status. That Bukhari is more powerful than the Quran or even on par with the Quran or even just slightly below the Quran. That is nonsense. That is utter nonsense. It is nothing. It's just like the rest of these books. It's, it's just like the rest of these books. And that's the truth. And I will demonstrate that. Okay, so, okay, so that's my first point. The second point is that, yes, Bukhari has problematic hadith in there. But, right, this is not the reason why I've began this Bukhari gate, by the way. But I'm just going to highlight that, yes, Bukhari does have problematic hadith in there, which are massively pro problematic, that are blasphemous, that are insulting, that are irrational, that make this deen look stupid, that embarrass Islam. All of these things it does have. And it has many which, are, which, are, which complement Islam. It does have many hadith which are just normal, complement Islam, give charity, do this, do that. It'll be fair, it has, but it has, but they're not the problem. The problem are these. Yes, and then this third uh, layer that can we establish Bukhari back to the Imam with, with confidence, beyond reasonable doubt? And the answer is we can't beyond reasonable doubt. There is way too much conflict. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, because people have become so offended, when I began this discussion, every single imam uh, that was of some kind of, like heavyweight, almost, not every single, but several heavyweight imams that have a huge following, decided to refute me. Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, made a post, people questioning Bukhari, blah, 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 blah. Why don't they just make their own sect? And become deviant, you know, like in their own ways. They claim to have. He's just talking about me. Um, she, uh, Ustad or Doctor uh, Doctor Jonathan Brown making a post that uh, directly he actually called me out very specifically. Mufti Abu Layth. Now, basically, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, every, I mean, it's become the topic. It's become the talk of uh, talk of the town. Sahil Bukhari. Everybody's speaking about it. Oh, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. Yet nobody's answering my questions. I asked a set of questions that look, how do you, how do you authenticate its transmission? Because this whole Sahil Bukhari rests on one person. Now, what, what I'm going to do is go over some of these key factors. I'm going to highlight some bullet points. Then I'm going to suspend this, show us what is the book we're dealing with, and then come back to these points and elaborate. Okay, so some of these factors to bullet point them are. How, this whole book rests on just one man. His name was Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. And I'm going to come to the discussion that some people try to say, oh, there was one, two others. But that's really, if we're just being honest, let's have integrity. It's really just one man, Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri, who's unvouched for in his time. Nobody seems to recognize him. And I'll come back to this. Secondly, al-Farabri's students themselves admit to his copy being incomplete. Thirdly, his students admit to al making alterations to, their, to his book. This is what they admit to. Fourthly, all of the students are copying from one script, yet all of them disagree amongst themselves. Five, all these disagreements are not just in chapter headings. They are in chapter headings, but not just chapter headings are not a problem. They are in chains. The names in the chains are different. There are hadith missing between themselves. They have errors. They, there's all sorts going on. right? There's hundreds of hadith missing between themselves. Okay. Then number six, 
that this all these different manuscripts that kind of tertiary manuscripts and fourth layer manuscripts that were out there uh, they are then met with this great makeover project by uh, by Sharifuddin al yunini okay he comes around the 7th to 8th century hijri he's commissioned to do a project and what he does is he gets whatever narrations he could find now he bases it on one he chooses one particular isolated narration and then he starts to patch up things now he states that he makes amendments he actually makes grammatical amendments and arabic amendments by help of the grammarian ibn malik now what on earth was going on there because if all those great legends of manuscripts were so f and and their scholars were so awesome in the preservation why are there arabic errors that need amendments so this is a a, a problem then the next problem is that even Yunini's copy that he makes is missing. And it's just people who've copied from him. So you could say, yeah, well, you know, they saw his copy, so they should be reliable, fine, except one of them, who Nwayri used to do it for commercial purposes. I mean, he was a great scholar, but he himself admits, I used to make copies and sell them for a thousand dinars, which was like an annual salary of a, like a military commander and, uh, of the time that's one copy he would sell it for now you know so that's some vested interest but even if we take his motive to be sincere why could he not make mistakes when all these great scholars before him wrote manuscripts out with their hands and they made mistakes because obviously Yunini corrected the mistakes grammatical mistakes so and then you have the final Sultania, which is Sultan Abdul Hamid, and they base it on certain things and they produce a copy. And even that is then amended in its first amendment, they find a hundred mistakes, at least. That's the Al-Azhari board that did that. So look, these are my issues. Now, people, before they flip, I would like to, first of all, I am not causing these problems. I want to make this clear. I'm not saying that Bukhari is dubious because I find some hadith problematic. Yes, it does help that cause as well, but that's not why. I do, in all my Monday nights with Mufti, go through several hadith inside Bukhari and I break down their chains and I show the chains are unreliable. And I will continue to do that. I have no problem in doing that. I'm not saying that because of that, I want to say the whole book is weak. The whole book I'm saying is, un, is questionable because it is questionable. Now, I'm not, making the, I'm not saying that, yes, it does complement the first part that there are problematic hadith in Bukhari, but it's not because of that. So now this, this whole thing about the authenticity of Bukhari, I want to just suspend that for a moment. I want you to hold your horses on that. I'm going to come back to that. I would like to, first of all, show what is this book we're actually dealing with. Okay, now... And why I don't think people should be so, they should be flipping about this book. Because this book, can, like, let's just take a look at some of the stuff it has in it. Okay, let's begin with a actual error in Sahil Bukhari. A factual error. People say, show me an actual error. Okay. In Kitab al-Tawheed, in the book of Tawheed. Right, Hadith 7517. Uh, through Imam Bukhari's teacher, Abdul, uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah, he's transmitted through Ibn Malik. Right now, this hadith, it speaks about the Isra, the, the night journey of the Prophet. Now to me, the night journey was a vision. Some people believe it was actual, that's their choice. Nevertheless, when did it happen? This is Sahil Bukhari. ليلة أسري برسول الله من مسجد الكعبة إنه جاءه ثلاثة نفر. So the day he went on this, it was from the Kaaba. Three people came to him. قبل أن يوحى إليه before he was even a prophet. Before he was even a prophet, he went on this night journey. Everybody rejects that as nonsensical. Everybody, nobody seems to say that that is uh, in any way uh, acceptable. 
Right, now, let's take a look at another example. Right, now, let's take a look at this. I want to show us something. In Kitab al-Talaq, right, Hadith 5255, okay. The Prophet comes to, to the house of this woman, Umayma bint Nu'man ibn Sharahin, and she has a maid with her as well. The Prophet says to her, he says to her, Hibi nafsaki li, give yourself to me. Okay. The Prophet, she's a Muslim by the way. The Prophet says to her, give yourself to me. Qalat, what does she respond? وَهَلْ تَهَبُ الْمَلِكَةُ نَفْسَهَا لِسُوقَ Does a queen give herself to low lives? These are her words. Look, Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari. Yeah. فَأَهْوَى بِيَدِهِ يَضَعُهُ يَدَهُ عَلَيْهَا Sorry, فَأَهْوَى بِيَدِهِ يَضَعُهُ يَدَهُ عَلَيْهَا No, it was correct. Then the Prophet tries to touch her. And she moves. And she says to him, A'udhu Billahi Ming, I seek refuge in Allah from you. From who? From the Prophet. Sahih al-Bukhari. Nonsense. Utter nonsense. Disrespecting our Prophet. Right, so, okay. Let's... But that's in Sahih al-Bukhari, that's in Kitab al-Talaq, uh, Hadith 5255. Okay. Right, now, let's take a look at another example. Okay, let's, whilst on the topic of prophets, Kitab al-Ghusl, Kitab al-Ghusl, Hadith on Momento 278. The Hadith is the an Abi Huraira. From the Prophet that Banu Israel used to take a bath naked. They used to look at each other. وَكَانَ مُوسَى يَغْتَسِلُ وَحْدَ And Musa used to bathe on his own. فَقَالُوا وَاللَّهِ مَا يَمْنَعُ مُوسَى يَغْتَسِلَ مَعَنَا إِلَّا أَنَّهُ آدَر They said, Wallahi, nothing stops Moses from taking a bath with us except that he has a swollen testicle. So he's got swollen testicles, okay, look. Adar. But wait there, just in case you don't believe me. In case you don't believe me. Hans were. What does Udra mean? Udra, this is a dictionary, means scrotal hernia. Your scrotum testicles have kind of swollen up. Okay, so... So for wada'a thawbahu ala al-hajar, he put his clothes on a rock, so the rock started to run away. So Musa alayhi salam was chasing after the rock saying, My clothes, O rock, thawbi ya hajar, thawbi ya hajar, hatta nadharat Banu Israel ila Musa. Faqalu, until Banu Israel could see him naked. Faqalu, wallahi ma bi Musa min ba'as. They said, you know what? He doesn't have a problem, his testicles seem normal. So, and then Musa akhada thawbahu fatafiqa bil hajari darban and he started getting angry and beating the rock up. This is Moses, alayhi salam. This is the respect that they want to, this is what they want to fight over. Yeah, so this is, so just to, just to show certain things. Let me show you another. This is our prophet, apparently this is how revelation used to work. And some of the ex-Muslims have picked up on this one as well. This is in Kitab Tafsir Al-Quran and uh, Hadith 4594. And that the Prophet, a verse was, and I've done, uh, I've covered this in a previous Monday night with Mufti and shown all these chains to be weak. But let me read it to you. That the Prophet said, call somebody that revelation has come. Uktub, write down. لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين والمجاهدون في سبيل الله. Write down that those who go out to fight are not the same as those who stay behind. 
and behind wa khalfun nabi wa khalfun nabi ibn ummi maktum and right behind the prophet was a blind man ibn ummi maktum and i've covered that whether his name was amr or abdullah in my previous session faqala ya rasulullah ana dharir he said oh ya rasulullah i'm but i'm blind why why am i being faulted fa nazalat makanaha so then revelation just came down there and then saying لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين غير أولي الضرر والمجاهدون في سبيل الله. Oh, those who are not disabled who stay behind. So the verse got immediately updated, and behind the prophet was the blind man. But the prophet didn't know, and God apparently didn't know that there's a blind man there. So why not reveal the verse properly? So this, okay. So this is, uh, and this is to show God and the Messenger of Allah in this light. Okay. Let's let's see. Uh, right, we've not stopped yet. Right, okay. Let's see what it says about our prophet. Okay, whilst we're on this topic, Bab Kitab al-Tib, the book of medicating, uh, Hadith number five seven six five, that the prophet had magic done unto him. كان رسول الله سحر حتى كان يرى أنه يأتي النساء ولا يأتيهن. The Prophet had magic done onto him until he used to falsely think that he'd had sex with his his wives, but he hadn't. But he used to think he had sex. And they used to tell him that no, you haven't. Wow. Wow. سبحان الله. This is our repayment of the Prophet towards the Prophet. Tell me, the Prophet people. Ha, so, oh, I just had sex. Oh no, no, you didn't. This is the Prophet of God getting such a statement. This isn't like, oh, I just put this glass down over here. Did I put it over here? Did I put it over there? Oh, I had sex. Oh, I, I don't even remember. Like I'm. It's not. I don't remember having sex. I do remember having sex when it didn't even happen. Where does testimony go? What about those people who came to the Prophet and said we committed adultery? Why was the Prophet taking them to task when he himself allegedly used to think he'd had sex and it never happened? How does it? Where does our Sharia remain? Where is the the justice in all of this? Where does that leave our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Now look, whilst we're on prophets. Kitab al-Ayman wal Nuzur, right? Hadith six six three nine. The Prophet Solomon alayhi salam. Qala Suleiman. Suleiman said, "Wallahi, tonight I will go and have sex with ninety women, right? Presumably his women. I mean, presumably his concubines, right? So I don't think they were wives. They're probably concubines. But I will have sex with ninety women." كلهن تأتي بفارس يجاهد في سبيل الله. All of them will bring me a warrior who will fight in the path of Allah. فقال له صاحبه. So his companion, he's telling a prophet of God. He's telling a prophet of God. Say insha Allah. فلم يقوله. He, the prophet, can't be bothered to say insha Allah. He's being reminded by a companion. Say insha Allah. He's saying, can't be bothered. فطاف عليهن جميعا. So then he had sex that night with ninety women. فلم تحمل منهن إلا امرأة واحدة. So none of them became pregnant except one. جاءت بشق رجل. So she came. She bore. Uh, she she gave birth to a handicapped child. So he was a disabled child. وأيم. Look at this. And then the prophet says. The prophet says. وَأَيْمُ الَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ That I swear by he who Muhammad's life is in his hands, if he had said, inshallah, they would have all been born as warriors and fighters. Meaning Allah punished him for, uh, for not saying, inshallah, he gave him a handicapped child. And this is a prophet of God who can't be bothered to say, I mean, just look at that hadith. That is disgust. I mean, that, that this is so disrespectful to our prophets. 
Then look, the attitude towards, I mean, this isn't generally that bad, but the attitude towards rich people. Okay. The Prophet said, Qumtu ala bab al -jannah. I stood on the door of paradise and the majority, masakin. majority of the people who entered it were poor people. Wa ashabul jaddi mahbusun. And those who are rich, they get held back. Why? Because they're rich. Wow. Okay. So, wait there. Now, now check this out. This is a hadith in Bukhari. Kitab al Khums, uh, hadith 3093. That Fatima came, radiallahu anha, came to Abu Bakr to ask him, can we have, can she have her inheritance? So Abu Bakr said no, because the prophets don't inherit. فَغَضِبَتْ Fatima to بِنْتُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ So she was angry, uh, the Messenger of Allah. فَهَجَرَتْ Abu Bakr She uh, boycotted and abandoned Abu Bakr. فَلَمْ تَزَلْ مُهَاجِرَتَهُ حَتَّى تُوفِيَتْ And she remained like that until she died. The daughter of the Prophet, uh, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa radiallahu anha, uh, according to this narration, was angry with Abu Bakr and died in that state of anger. This is Bukhari. I'm not making this up. This is in Sahil Bukhari. I've given the uh, the Arabic. Check this out. This one's quite hilarious. Uh, hadith Kitab al Zaba'ih was Sayyid. You've got Hadith. Right, this is uh, 5492. It continues from that chapter anyway. It ends with Abu Darda radiallahu an saying regarding a particular uh, meal that is cooked. That was, uh, it was like a particular kind of food that they had, like a soup kind of thing. Now check this out. Listen to this Arabic. Zabah al khamra al ninan wa shams. Right. This is nonsensical Arabic. This Arabic makes no sense. Okay. And what's hilarious is that the classical scholars like Al Qabisi and these great early Maliki legends who were the early founders that had the manuscripts, the, the kind of tertiary manuscripts, they cross this out as a, a mistake because it makes no sense. Later scholars still embraced it and, this, and they try to justify what on earth this means. And they all seem to, you know, it's like a few people in a room, one person's justified and they're all like, yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> Let me just translate what that says. Zabah al khamra He slaughtered the alcohol. An ninanu. No idea what ninan is. Do you know what they tried to say? Ninan is plural of the letter noon. You know the letter noon. <laughs> the letter noon in Arabic, they said the plural is ninan, which means they're saying noon now means fish. Just because in the surah noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun, they said noon might mean a fish. So they're saying here ninan means fish because. Noon, the letter noon, all of a sudden means fish. Was shams and the sun. Even if, okay, so the alcohol, okay, check this out. The alcohol was slaughtered by the noons and the sun. <laughs> I mean, what on earth is that even on about? But then they're all like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes brilliant, beautiful sense. It's like I read all these commentaries. People are like, nah. No, no, no. Of course. I mean, it's it's awkwardly worded, but it makes beautiful sense. <laughs> I'm like, for God's sake, at least be honest. So Ibn Hajar, same thing. Ibn Hajar says, oh, it's awkwardly worded, but it makes sense. What he's trying to say. Okay, what they, let me tell you what they're trying to say. They're trying to say that uh, Abu Darda believed that you can turn, you can purify alcohol, which, by the way, most scholars believe. The alcohol, if it's turned into vinegar, it can be used, as the hadith said, that the best of your alcohol, the best of your vinegar is the alcohol, is the vinegar of your alcohol. Now, so many people used to use that. So what they're trying to say is Abu Darda also believed that 
that you could, you know, you could kind of use alcohol and have it kind of whatever the fermenting process is and turn it into vinegar. Okay, fine. And they're trying to say he believed you could eat fish. It was halal to eat fish, which everybody believed it was halal to eat fish because the Quran says, lakum Sayyidul Bahar, and whatever's in the sea is halal for you. But anyway, and the sun. I don't know what the sun, but the sun is is maybe a means of purifying stuff. This is what they. So what they're trying to say is, Abu Darda by saying you can use purified alcohol. Sorry, you can use alcohol that's turned into vinegar. He's using the term you can slaughter alcohol. The bahal khamra, slaughtered alcohol. What slaughtered it? The fish did. And the sun. They've gone through so much, the, the, the gymnastics they've done to try to make sense of that statement. Nobody's got a problem with saying you can eat fish, it's halal, that's fine. Nobody's got a problem with saying you can use vinegar from alcohol. Nobody's got a problem with those things. I'm not, I haven't got a problem. With, this statement, my friend, is absurd. Like, stop, just stop it. Just stop. <laughs> You're doing it right now. Just stop it. You know, it's like, this is making you look silly. Like, you've got to just accept when something is absurd. Like the early scholars crossed this out as a clear syntactical mistake. They said it, it doesn't make any sense what this is talking about. Right, so let's take a look, people. Let's take a look. Now, okay, here's something interesting in Bukhari. Since we're speaking about the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his marriage to Aisha. The Prophet's marriage to Aisha. Hadith 5133. He married her when she was six years old. That's in Bukhari. Six years old. There is another one, I think she says seven, but in this one, very clearly six. And then he consummated the marriage uh, when she was nine. Wow. Wow. The Prophet is looking at a six-year-old child with the intent of marriage, which is a sexual relationship. That is disgusting and it is an attack on the honor of our Prophet. And let me tell you something, let me tell you something. These people say that, oh, the six-year-olds then, the nine-year-olds then were like 18-year-olds today. What? Are you smoking crack? The nine-year-olds were like 18-year-olds. What on earth are you on about? Did she, I want to ask one question. Did she consent? Did she consent to this nikah? Bukhari. Hadith. The chapter heading 42. Hadith 5136. It comes on the page after it. La yunkihul ab wa ghayruhul bikr wa thayyib illa bi ridaha. That a father cannot force his child, his virgin daughter or divorcee daughter into a marriage. And there is a hadith. La tankihul ayyim. So this one is about that. The next one, innal. Uh, there's several hadith here he actually brings. So he says that. إِذَا زَوَّجَ إِبْنَتَهُ وَهِيَ كَارِهَا فَنِكَاهُهُ مَرْدُودٌ Her nikah is rejected if she doesn't want it. And then they transmit from Mujammi' uh, Ibn Jariya that Khansa, uh, the daughter of Khidam, was al Ansariya, her father married her off and she didn't like it. The Prophet revoked the marriage. And then this hadith, look, وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْبِكَرِ وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْبِكَرِ that, she, that a, a young girl or a virgin girl cannot be married until you take permission. And then the Prophet said, even if at that point her way of giving permission was just like being silent and being or smiling or things like this, that is fine based on customary practices. But you must take consent. How on earth does a six year old consent? How does that happen? Does she even understand anything? 
Does she understand what this deen is about? To consent? They say, yeah, but the custom. What custom? How do you force a six-year-old into a marriage? Allah hasn't even said that she must pray. She's not even held liable. And they say, yeah, but she... No. Uh, so, so tell me, why didn't the Prophet just consummate the marriage then? They say, oh, but she was young. Was she... Because, what, what do you mean she was young? Was she too young to consent? So it was a forced marriage, which ought to be rejected? Is that, is that, what, it, is that what it was? And they say, yeah, but, you know, she, but when she was nine, she had the physical maturity of a, a 17, 18 year old. Oh, wow. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I haven't finished. Abu Dawood. Mata yu'mar, that when do you command the child to pray? Now this is a hadith which Abu Dawood and other scholars declare sahih, right? Hadith, this is in Bab, Mata yu'mar al-ghulam uh, bis salah, Bab 25, this hadith is 491. Maybe the, the chapters vary, sorry, the numbering varies in different editions. Uh, that The hadith says, the Prophet said, Muru awladakum bis salah, wa hum abna'u saba. Look. Command your children to pray, and they are seven. Okay, now listen to this. And discipline them at the age of ten if they're still not praying. And discipline can mean different things. It doesn't have to mean like uh, being forceful. But that's not the point. The latter point. So yet Aisha didn't even have to be praying. But the latter point. At the age of 10, separate them in the beds. So the brother and the sister are sleeping together. And according to the Quran, that the Arabs used to, that's a verse in the Quran, that they used to customarily sleep generally naked. A lot of them. Now, so they're sleeping together, these 18 year old bodies of boys and girls sleep together but oh they can do that but when they're 10 the prophet said start separating them but they've got 18 year old bodies though oh but it's okay so but once they're 10 then they must have like 20 year old bodies so separate them when they're 10 but don't separate them when they're nine nine is like they're only 18 year old physical bodies i mean how stupid does do people have to get Seriously, like this is the stuff that is in our tradition that we are pushing out there. We are embarrassing ourselves. We are doing a disservice to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On one hand, he's saying, oh yeah, brothers, sisters, they all sleep together. Then we're trying to say, yeah, but he's marrying a girl because she's physically so mature now. She's like a woman. Wow. Oh, but by the way, Allah doesn't even say she has to pray yet because she's mentally not that mature. Oh, but... But well, obviously she gets sexual consent. She understands what that is. She just doesn't understand what to pray means. What kind of a stupid statement is this? Why are we absolutely just dissing the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in such a way? So these are the things, people. When This is what is in Sahil So I don't feel that this... The way people have placed this book on God's status can be tolerated. So yes, part one of my point was that I will continue to deconstruct these hadith. I will show them upon their individual merits to be weak and unreliable. Every single one that uh, what Dr. Jonathan Brown and people were sharing that there's three people transmitting from Aisha, every single one is unreliable. Every single one. And I will, inshallah, uh, demonstrate that in time to come. But I will, I just wanted to highlight all of this for now, show the, the, the problematic narrations, the disrespect, and there's many more, which I've only shown a portion there's ones that Umar radiallahu an is saying to the Prophet, what is he, is, does he, is he chatting nonsense? And this is the one that the Shia keep going on about uh, to Sunnis that how, how is that, you know, you guys are saying, because saying that, you know, uh, you know, has he, is he just speaking nonsense? 
that he sa he says that to the prophet when he's ill. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful to our prophet. It's disrespectful to Umar. There's hadith in here that Umar is apparently saying, "Oh, I still remember the extra verse of the Quran about stoning people, and I would write it down if it wasn't for people to to, to that would create a hoo ha." What nonsense is that? There's verses in here, uh, sorry, there's hadith in here, companions saying, I remember this surah used to be much longer than that surah. And, okay, the, people could say that was their memory, fair enough, they just misunderstood something, fine. There's hadith in here about monkeys uh, committing adultery. Monkeys and adultery, what the hell are you even on about? What is this monkey ethics? You know, monkeys and adultery. And then the other monkeys are stoning the monkey because he committed adultery. Adultery is to do with the institution of marriage. Institutions don't exist in the monkey world or in the animal world. Okay, these are human psychosocial constructs. We have come up with these things. They don't exist with animals, for God's sake. And I've said this time and time again. I've got a whole uh, uh, dedicated kind of segment to this as well on YouTube that look, this is what Wittgenstein and these people said, that these are parts of the human imaginative realm we've come up with. You, you, even if an animal could speak to us, we wouldn't, it wouldn't understand us because we've got so many of these constructs. Like the institution of marriage is just a, a mental construct that humans have made up. And so my point is animals don't have, to, they don't like, oh, you've committed adultery, we're going to now. It does, I'm not saying they don't fight. Of course they fight, of course they attack each other, of course they wound and kill each other. But you don't attribute human, you don't say an animal murdered another animal. You would say killed, not murdered, because it carries a certain motive. And you wouldn't say things like an animal committed adultery. That's just stupid. <laughs> right? That's, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so this is my whole point of trying to show that, look, Yes, although there are several hadith in Sahih Bukhari that are complementary to Islam. They are fine. They, they have no problems with them. They speak of normal things like charity or saying something good about the Prophet or they'll say something. There's fine. There, there are hadith like that. There's many hadith like that. I'm not denying that. But there are some very troubling hadith in here. And because we've given it this divine status, we are now suffering. The hadith about women lacking intellect, the hadith about women being uh, majority of the inhabitants of the hellfire, that was actually in there. So you, you've got, and I've shown this previously, that right. So that this is this is exactly why people then have a problem with Islam, because they're like, see. That's that hadith there, that the, uh, I stood on the, on the door, on the gates of hell, and I saw the majority of those who were the inhabitants of the hellfire were women. What nonsense. Why women? Let's be honest, like the majority of crime and the majority of warfare, bloodshed, all of these things is done by men. So these kind of hadith, you can clearly see people have fabricated them, they or they've misunderstood them. Now that's just touching up on Imam Bukhari himself. There's some important points to note. You see, first of all, Imam Bukhari himself used to allow riwaya bil ma'na. He would allow people to transmit hadith with meaning, and he would do that himself as well. So this is a page from Sira Alam in Nubala. There's the reference. Sira Alam in Nubala, where uh, you have the governor of Bukhara is having a discussion, Ibn Abi Ja'far, with uh, Imam Bukhari, and he tells him, Look, Imam Bukhari says, Rubba hadithin sami'tu bil Basra, I heard many a hadith in Basra, but I wrote them when I reached Sham. So, entirely different region. And many a hadith I heard in Sham. Sham is like where Palestine, Syria, Jordan, these parts are. He says, many a hadith I heard in Sham, but I wrote them in Egypt. فَقُلْتُ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِكَمَالِهِ So he says, I said, يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Was that with its entirety? Like, did you actually remember it spot on, verbatim? And he says, فَقَالَ فَسَكَتْ He went silent. So he became, uh, 
like kind of like so here in the commentary Shaib ar Naut writes that this is very clear sorry in the Hamish in the margin that Anna al-Bukhari yara jawaz al-riwaya bil ma'na you see he sees that it is permissible and that's as you can see that's in Sirah Alam in nubala in volume 21 page 411 now that's an example that Bukhari did used to see these things as permitted and that does add to part of the problem another thing is even Bukhari himself saw it permissible if the motivation was there to to kind of do tadlis to hide the names of people so the the reader can't tell who he's talking about now this is an example of uh, this is from Mizan al-Atidal of Imam Dhahabi right there it is now there's an example of uh, Abdullah ibn Saleh al-Juhani the Egyptian is a person a Dhahabi says in you've got here in volume 2 page 440 to 442 he says waqad rawa anhu al-Bukhari Imam Bukhari did transmit from him in his Sahih walakin yudallisuhu he used to just say Abdullah and wouldn't give his full name because he knew people would find problems with him. Then Dhahabi goes on to say, Dhahabi goes on to say, one of his teachers who is very famous, uh, Al-Dhuhli, Muhammad ibn Yahya Al-Dhuhli, who became a bit problematic because some people started also deeming him for a moment as a deviant as well. So Imam Bukhari would transmit from him, وَيُدَلِّسُهُ كَثِيرًا يُدَلِّسُهُ كَثِيرًا He would give so much, he, he would transmit from him in some places over 30 times. His name was Muhammad ibn Yahya Zuhali. Now, but check this out. How Imam Bukhari would actually refer to him. So he would refer to him. He would use the name either just Muhammad. So you don't know which Muhammad it was. Because he's got many teachers as Muhammad. Or Muhammad ibn Abdullah which was his grandfather's name and he wasn't known by that name or Muhammad ibn Khalid which was a, a greater grandfather now so when he would just say Muhammad so he would use his grandfather or his great grandfather's name because nobody knew uh, who that was when he would use the name Muhammad, you would have no idea. Is he talking about Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhli? Is he talking about Muhammad ibn Salam, Muhammad ibn Muslim, ibn Wara, Muhammad ibn Idris, Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Samnani, Muhammad ibn Aban, Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Baykandi, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Bawshanji, Muhammad ibn Nadr al-Nisapuri, Muhammad ibn Rafi, Muhammad ibn Ma'mar. These are all Muhammads that he transmits from. So when he's saying just Muhammad, you don't know who he's talking about. And he would do that on purpose. That have said, as you can see, that look, can you dalisu anhu kathiran? He would do that a lot. You dalisu anhu kathiran. Okay. And that's in his volume 12, page 275 of Sirah Alam in Nubala. So even Imam Bukhari didn't always stick by his rules. Okay. So you've got to remember that. Now, Imam Muslim, this is why he criticizes him as well. But that said, my problem per se is not with Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari, even though he didn't stick by his rules, and to be fair, he also bent the rules, just like people before him. Um, but by and large, he, 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 his theory came up with a gold standard. Okay, like he, he said that for a hadith to be sahih, he added these extra layers, these conditions by, by saying that you can't just say, like he, he said that basically when you have two people in a chain, like let's say Abdullah heard from Umar, how do we know because they're contemporaries? He said that's not enough. We have to have evidence that they actually met and heard from each other, which is amazing. Which is amazing. I, 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 I like that standard he brought, although he didn't always apply it. He didn't always apply. Let me give you an example. This is this book uh, is a book by Dar Qutni. It is known as Al Ilzamat wa Tatabu. People disagree whether there were two books or one book, but the point is they're written together, published together. In here, you will see now uh, Dar Qutni brings, uh, he finds problematic 
uh, probably over about 217 or over around approximately that many hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari which he says are massively uh, problematic and invalid. So he, 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 and then there's some debate in some are worse than others and some may not be that bad but he finds them all to have fallen short of being Sahih. Okay, um, so these are some of the, the problems. Another thing you see is Imam Bukhari's teacher so who is Imam Bukhari taking from as well? So on some occasions he would take from people who were really weird. Like he would take like, so one of his teachers, as you can see here, uh, this is page 403 in his uh, Kitab al that uh, Bukhari took from the teacher uh, Imran ibn Hattan. Um, so, so he takes from, sorry, from this Rawi, from uh, Ibn Umar. Now this is a person who he, he uses, sorry, um, as an acceptable Rawi. So people, what I'm trying to highlight here are, is that Imam Bukhari himself didn't always live up to his conditions. Why? Because this person, Imran ibn Hitban, was a an extremist. Khawarij were those people who were savage. They were like, literally like ISIS to the power of 10. They In that age, I mean, they are the forefathers of ISIS. They were ruthless. They hated uh, most of the companions. They declared them kafir. They said if anybody committed a sin, they would kill them. They were literally like that. So this person, Imran ibn Hattan, is a Khariji. And you see what's interesting is uh, uh, you've got here from Hafid as well, from Abu Abbas al-Mubarrid, that Kana Imran ra'sul ka'diya min as safariya wa khatibuhum wa sha'iruhum. Even though they say he himself didn't participate in the killing, but he was one of the key sympathizers and used to write poetry. Uh, praising them and encouraging them. And even Hafid here mentions, um, you've got, he, he says which one of the Khawarij they were. He used to call people, uh, proselytize his, his, his ways, try to convert people. He, and he's the guy who praised the murderer of Sayyidina Ali in poetry. Uh, and then, and yet the scholar said, but we accept him in hadith because uh, some scholars like Abu Dawood and others said, you know, these khawarij, they're so upstanding when it comes to hadith because they believe this to be a sin. But that's stupid because anybody who can justify murder, how on earth, what on earth is, is, is a lie? If you can justify murder, Nothing else matters. I mean, lying, it, it, it doesn't even, it's not even a blip on the radar. But wait there. Even Hafid uh, Ibn Hajar in Tahdib al Tahdib says under this person's uh, commentary that what Abu Dawood said that the Khawarij, because they used to see lying as haram, we accept their hadith. He said that doesn't, that's not true because Ibn Abi Hatim transmits from some of the scholars like Ibn Lahi and others and Ba'd al Khawarij that that they openly admitted later on, Kanu ida hawa amran, if they desired something, sayyaruhu hadithan. Look, that they actually used to make up hadith. And duh, that's no surprise. I mean, I don't know why they're so shocked about that. If, if, I, if, I, if I can justify murder, lying is a piece of cake. So that is to show that, first of all, even Imam Bukhari himself, Yes, his standard did beat the other standards. I accept that. The other people, he was more strict than them. But even he had many shortcomings in his own theory. Because he would allow people like this. He would take their narrations. He would do stuff like this. But he is not the key problem. Imam Bukhari, I respect. He tried hard. He did kind of put together a huge... Uh, I mean, he had this effort. But what happens towards the end of his life... He is tortured, uh, tortured at least mentally. He's kind of chucked out of his, 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 he's ostracized. He has to leave home. And the irony is that people claimed he was a deviant. So they said he had deviant beliefs, like he believed the Quran wasn't creative. And that debate is meaningless, by the way. It doesn't even mean anything. But they said that he believed that the actual Mus'haf, the actual book is created, which it is. So I don't know. But the, 
this debate is meaningless anyway, but they use that as an excuse to really have a go at him and not just have a go, but to ostracize him, boycott him and blacklist him. So he was chucked out of his hometown, Bukhara, and the two main groups who hated on him were the Hanafis, the Hanafi method, because he attacked Imam Abu Hanifa in his book and in several of his teachings, he was very critical of Imam Abu Hanifa. And secondly, the proto-Wahhabis. So the Hanbalis in Aqidah, the Wahhabis today are basically Hanbali in Aqidah. They're these kind of literalists who take the hadith literally that God has certain body parts and he does this and he does that. These people are like basically the absolute literally. So they used to believe even the book of the Quran, the actual book is uncreated, which makes zero sense, but they're not about making sense. So they hated on him and the Hanafis hated on him. And they are the two groups that did the, the, were behind the propaganda for him suffering. And he suffered for the last four or five years of his life. And he just, you know, he was out and, and immensely, especially in the last couple of years, he was out just wandering. People wouldn't even allow him into towns. He would have to wait at the gate and sometimes they would reject him. Sometimes they would allow him in and then cause a stir. Now, why is this important? The irony, by the way, is these are the same two groups today trying to d divine, you know, like almost semi-worship his book and they want to establish his book at, with certainty. The same two groups who led to his persecution. Now, had of they not persecuted him then, his book might have actually reached us quite with certainty. <laughs> That's the irony of history. That You see, the book doesn't reach us with certainty because of the suffering inflicted on him by the Hanafis and the Hanbalis. The Hanbalis in Aqidah, the, the kind of Wahhab, proto-Wahhabis. Now, and they are the two people today trying to say no it reaches us and they, they want to make sure so that's ironic but why is this point important this point is important because imam bukhari was no longer teaching any name associated with him became toxic so people were refusing to promote him refusing to transmit hadith from him hence none of these people transmit hadith from him at that point imam muslim boycotts him all these people boycott him now, if he had continued to teach up until his dying breath, maybe more people would have transmitted Bukhari. Now, Bukhari is only transmitted really through one person, Farabri, Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. And this is the key part we want to come to. Now, check this out, people. Imam Bukhari, everything in his book is uh, so... Um, He puts, obviously, everything in his book. Uh, all the narrators are supposed to be absolutely sound in Imam Bukhari's book. They're supposed to be absolutely sound. <laughs> but, but I've got a little surprise here. <laughs> right. In Kitab al-Ilm, right, hadith uh, on the section of 62 coming down. Haddathana wa akhbarana Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. Huh? Wait a minute. This is Imam Bukhari's book. But Farabri is in his book. Haddathana Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. So, Imam Bukhari is in his own book. <laughs> he is in his own chain, in his own book. So, this is his book, but yet, <laughs> his student is in his book, and then he's, he's not even narrating from himself. He's the second person in the chain. <laughs> <laughs> right so this this is the kind of uh, comedy we've got to put up with so that's there just in case people didn't catch that and just in case you know all this uh right so that's in kitab al ilm but i'll i'll let it go I, I mean i showed it it's it's there earlier on right so he is in his own book and he's not even the f f he's not even the first person he's the second person in the chain <laughs> That's one awesome way to, to vouch for yourself. Everybody in this book is sound. Oh, I'm in there as well, by the way. <laughs> right, so who is... So now we'll wonder who is Farabri. Okay, one interesting... Some interesting points I just want to clarify because a lot of people have been saying that, look, I'm getting this stuff... I'm misquoting and doing things like this, so I'd like to kind of clarify. 
Farabri is really the key transmitter of this is taken from Sira Alam in Nubala, right? So Imam that we're co they're calling him Imam Farabri. He's it's not <laughs> okay if you want to use Imam <laughs> Chalo <laughs> doesn't bother me, but uh, he heard from Imam Bukhari twice, as Zahabi says. He heard from him. Um, now, and there's a problem, by the way. He also claims, Zama Annahu Sami'a. See, check this out. He made a claim that he heard from Qutaybah ibn Sa'id. Right, so. Now, some people say, okay, well, that's because some people made that claim. But, and that isn't even possible because he's just a little kid at that point. But, okay, let's not be, let's let us let that go. It's not an issue. Is, he heard the Jami' of Sahih, Fi Sanati Thamanin Wa Arba'in, right, in the year uh, 240, uh, what is it, 248, and then, once again, in the year 252. Now, that's Imam Bukhari dies around, what is it, 264, 265, around that uh, time. So this is years before, like much before Imam Bukhari has actually kind of passed away or anything like this, okay? Now, so, is this person, Farabri, reliable? Now, first of all, Imam Bukhari had many students, okay? According to Farabri himself, Khatib al-Baghdadi brings a chain quoting Farabri to say there were 90,000 people who transmitted Sahil Bukhari from Imam Bukhari. And then he goes on to say, but none of them are alive today doing it except me. <laughs> and that's like, uh, <laughs> okay, mate, if you say so. But that's slightly... Uh, uh, but there were many others who transmitted. And I'll just, you know, before digressing, let's just show some of them. So here is an here is one of them, Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal. Now Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal is one of the main early senior transmitters of Imam Bukhari. He was a scholar of Hadith, and he is vouched. Now you see a scholar in the fifth century, four hundreds. Abu Ya'la al Khalili says he's vouched for. Not a problem. The issue is Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal did transmit the uh, his version of Sahil Bukhari, but it was incomplete. And although some people did go on to... So this, here it is, right? It reaches us, parts of it, through Khattabi in a summary that he did. But in this summary of Khattabi, there are only 1,200 hadith. And even in the introduction, he writes that, by the way, uh, the entire copy of Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal did not reach me, even though there's only one person between them. His teacher is the student of ibn Ma'akal. He says that there was from Kitab al-Ahkam, the rest, there's a few hadith, and then it's all missing. Now, you may say maybe there's a substantial amount there, fine, but what he preserves in his summary is only 1,200 hadith. Out of 7,700, 7,700, which are found in the normal transmissions. So, so that's one uh, thing. So Ibn Ma'akal doesn't really reach us. Uh, and I'll come back to this claim in a moment. There's another scholar by the name of uh, Hamad Ibn Shakir. Once again, vouched for by Al-Mustaghfiri by the Hafiz, who, who's in the 400s again. So he vouches for him, says he's a reliable scholar. Yet, hardly nothing really reaches us through Ibn Shakir that is bis-sama, that is taught, that is taught, okay? Now, people might say, yes, but Farabri was the, the, the most junior student of Imam Bukhari, that's why. Aha, but you wrong once again. Imam al-Bazdawi, okay, Abu Talha Mansur al-Bazdawi. He is the final person to transmit the uh, Sahih of Bukhari. وَكَانَ آخِرُ مَنْ حَدَّثَ بِالْجَامِعِ الصَّحِيعَ عَنِ الْبُخَارِ 
And he was declared a thiqa by Ibn Makula, once again from the 400s. He was declared reliable, although some people problematized him, but he was there. So look, people have no issue in declaring those people reliable, even though one could question, did they even know them? But yet Bukhari does not reach us through these people. There's been a lot of claims that we have Sahil Bukhari through all of these sources. Now that's a lie. I just want to highlight that. This is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in his introduction to Fatul Bari, Hadi Sari. Okay, he writes. He, he's going through all the transmissions of Bukhari that reach him. So he mentions, look what Ibrahim ibn Ma'aqal al-Nasafi. He says, "Wafata minha qit'atan min akhirihi rawaha bil ijaza." Right. Okay. So. He says that a piece of it is missing. But okay, fine. He says, So we got ijaza of this, as in we found it and people transmitted, but not through teaching people were working from. It was something that was found that they kind of used at times for additional maybe complementary support, but it wasn't as reliable. Now, look, he says, And Hamad ibn والرواية. This is Ibn Hajar. والرواية التي اتصلت بالسماع That the riwayah that reaches us with actual teaching, listening to. So you know all these people online saying we've got all these different transmissions. No, you have. Listen, listen. The transmission that comes through teaching that people actually relied on في هذه الأعصار in these ages وما قبلها and those ages before us here, Riwaya to Muhammad ibn Yusuf al Farabri. This is Ibn Hajar declaring that. But wait, why take his word for it? This Ibn Rushayd, right, this is an Andalusi scholar who, once again, from the 8th century, 700s, who's very trying to go, going out of his way to justify Farabri. And Sahil Bukhari, in fact, he even misrepresents the truth. Uh, now he states, this is from him in his book, Ifadatul Nasih, which is in print. He says, look, and this is, you've got this on page 18 of his book. وَالطَّرِيقُ الْمَعْرُوفُ الْيَوْمِ لَلْبُخَارِ فِي مَشَارِقِ الْأَرْضِ وَمَغَارِبِهَا بِاتِّسَالِ السِّمَاعِ that the, the, the copy we have of Bukhari with continuous teaching and sama is Tariq al-Farabri wa ala riwayati i'tamad al-nas li kamaliha. Now he says because of its perfection, but that's not true, but that's just because that's the one they actually had. He also goes on to misrepresent facts by saying, look, Farabri kana indaw aslul Bukhari. He claims that Farabri had a copy of Imam Bukhari's actual work, and that's not true, and I'll show that in a moment. But that's his actual... Now, in another, on another page, he also highlights, he says, Infiradul farabri bi riwayatil jami'i sahih ala kathrati rawati Despite many people transmitting Bukhari, farabri is the only one who has its transmission. And he says, look... حَتَّى فَرَدَ بِرِوَايَةِ الصَّحِيْ زَمَانًا لِذَهَابِ رُوَاتِهِ Until he became, that's on page 17, he became the sole transmitter of Bukhari. So all these people online trying to say we've got transmissions that are connected. Look, this is the problem. They're not being honest. They, yes, there may be books that were found. There may be books that they gave, but that was like wijada. That was like, because remember, it has to reach from them to us. Not just from them, maybe Ibn Ma'akal's books, maybe something from Ibn Shakir did reach people a few generations after him and a few generations after them. But the point is, it definitely didn't even reach Ibn Hajar, which is hundreds of years ago, six, seven, 600 years ago at least you're looking at. Now, and it definitely didn't reach us. So we have to be honest about this. And even, look, this is before that, Qadi Iyad, now he claims in his time, some people, and he's much before, uh, much before, uh, what is it, Ibn Hajar, he claims that 
uh, the riwayah that we have today, uh, he says that there is some parts of Nasafis, that's Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal's thing, floating around. But the main thing is from uh, Al-Farabri. And I'll show where he, he gives all these riwayat. He gives all these chains, pages on end. This is from his Mashariq al-Anwar. All pages on end going back to Farabri from so many different students, which, by the way, the manuscripts all vary, but they're going back to uh, Farabri. He then says, وَأَمَّا رِوَايَةُ النَّسَفِي That's Ibrahim ibn Ma'aqil فَكَتَبَ بِهَا الشَّيْخ الْحَافِظ أَبُوْ عَلِي الْغَسَّانِ So he says, so and so wrote it to me, gave me ijazah in it. He says, إِلَّا أَنَّ النَّسَفِي فَاتَهُ مِنْ آخِرِ الْكِتَابِ شَيْءٌ مِنْ كِتَابِ الْأَحْكَامِ He says that he, he missed a Nasafi's copy, didn't he? It wasn't complete. It missed a certain part from Kitab al-Ahkam. Uh, he got that from... ثُمَّ مَا بَعْدَهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي رِوَايَةِ النَّسَفِي إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْكِتَابِ Whatever's after that to the end, it was not in his book. Um, and then he mentions there's some hadith in there from here or, or there. So this is... Uh, and then he mentions on page 63 وَقَدْ وَصَلَ إِلَيْنَا مِنْ رِوَايَةِ الْفَرَبْرِ وَأَكْثَرُ الْرِوَايَاتِ مِنْ طَرِيقِهِ And this is really what most of everything is from. And he, like I said... He spends, uh, and then he says there's some parts that have reached us from uh, Ibrahim ibn Ma'akal and Nasafi. And like I said, he said they're incomplete. Within generations after him is Ibn Rushayd, who lives in Spain, says it definitely doesn't reach him. Uh, ibn, uh, ibn Hajar says it doesn't reach them, except uh, not with teaching anyway, not with Sama. Okay. Now you might say, well, is that really an issue? Look. Now this is Qadi Yad in his book Ilma saying اختلفت عمة الحديث that they've disagreed with the hadith ما وجد من الحديث بالخط المحقق لإمام if you find a book that is certain like it's written by the handwriting of an imam a thika, a reliable person or it's an asal manuscript can you use it? Look at this this is page 49 with their consensus he says that you cannot teach from that because you don't know if it's the words of the prophet so now some of these people are saying this is really much ado about nothing is it because the question is why did nobody declare imam uh, we're calling him imam but muhammad ibn yusuf al-farabri why did nobody declare him to be reliable? This is the question. Because he lives in a time where many people, he is rubbing shoulders with some of these great scholars. Of He's obviously met Bukhari. He's in the time of Abu Hatim, Abu Zur'a. He's in the time of people like Imam Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood. He's in the time of Nasa'i. He's in the time of Ibn Abi Hatim, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Hibban. He's in the time of all of these great, and some of them are junior to him, or like some of them may be senior. Nobody who actually knows him ever vouched for him as reliable. How, like, what on earth is going on? Because, and then they say, well, okay. Now, you see, People claim that, uh, you see, this was the same, what, um, this was the same uh, scholar Ibn Rushayd, who's from Al-Andalus, the 7 800s. He tries to, in his book that I was reading from, Ifadatul Nasir, on page 15, he, dec he writes all those people who said uh, Frabri was reliable. The problem is, look, he states, first of all, that Abu walid al-Baji claims he was reliable. Abu walid al-Baji is an early great master, Don Maliki from Muslim Spain. He claims that he said, Farabri thiqatun mashhur. The problem is nobody has ever come, nobody ever quotes that. Nobody. Even Zahabi, even Ibn Hajar who quotes al-Baji, never quotes that, that he was reliable. They never quote that from Baji. They never quote his name. So where has Baji said this? It's not in any of his books that we know. Where has he said this? Now, 
He claims, and he's obviously hundreds, like 300 years after Bhaji, but he claims that Bhaji said it. But none of the other scholars who are contemporary to him ever quote Bhaji as saying this. So this is highly suspect. Because Bhaji has a book on Sahil Bukhari, but it's not in there. So where is he saying this? Then check this out. He quotes Abu Bakr Sam'ani, a scholar from the 400s again, from the 5th century, who states about Farabri, وَكَانَ ثِقَةً وَرِعًا He was a reliable. First of all, Abu Bakr Sam'ani never met. He is much after, much after Farabri. Over, we're talking over 100 years, over towards 150 years he's living anyway. He's living much after him, at least a century after him. He, he's never known him. He's never known perhaps anybody who's actually directly known Farabri. One question is how does he declare him to be a thiqa? When he's never actually, because to say somebody's reliable, you're speaking about their memory, their precision, their kind of general good behavior. And you've never, it's like me declaring somebody from the 19th century to be reliable, I've, I've never known the person. But the plot thickens people the plot thickens that is that check this out look in the manuscripts what does it say oh but in this book of ibn rushaid in manuscript b this sentence of samani is missing it's not even there that he says that samani declared him to be reliable you see that this is interesting and i'll tell you why this gets even more interesting because uh, Sam'ani, he has a son by the name of Abu Sa'ad. Now, when I was transmitted, uh, referring to this previously, I thought, because people, once again, tertiary sources keep mixing them up. Some people say it was the son, some people say it was the father. The father is Abu Bakr that we're talking about. So I thought to be on the safe side, we'll go with the son because he has a book on people. But as it appears, you see, in his book, this is from his book, Al Ansab, Lis Sam'ani. He does declare other people to be thiqa. So there's a page where he begins by declaring somebody, as you can see, thiqa and reliable in hadith. But then it comes to Farabri, 3006. Farabri, he talks about him. He says everything. He does not declare him in any way to be reliable. He doesn't even use, he doesn't say he's thiqa. And he doesn't even say that my father declared him to be thiqa. But then when he goes on to speak about another Farabri, somebody else, this is not Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri, straight after him, Abu Bakr uh, ibn Aisha al-Muqri al-Farabri, he says he's a thiqa, by the way. But about Farabri, nowhere to be seen. So where, the question is, when they say he is reliable, who has vouched for him? The earliest that they're going with are people that, first of all, never ever met him, came over a hundred years after him. And then secondly, it's very suspect that they even said this because it's not in their books. Their, his book, Al-Amali, is either not in print. People who had seen it said they never saw it in there. So it's, it's highly suspect. And this, by the way, is one of the attacks that even the Shia... Uh, have brought up against Farabri in saying that why are Sunnis trying to use Abu Bakr Sam'ani when we've checked their sources, Abu Bakr Sam'ani doesn't seem to be saying this. Now, because I highlighted this in one of my posts, somebody started to say, oh, he's getting influenced by the Shia. <laughs> See, this is the, the stupid kind of responses that I have to face. So this is the issue with Farabri. The other thing is that people are saying, well, okay, fine, but because uh, people transmitted from him, that should make it okay. That should make it fine. Because he had at least one scholar of hadith called al Hafid ibn Sakan who transmits from him. Therefore, it should be at least fine. Because even though he didn't say that he's reliable. <laughs> See, even Ibn Sakan, who's Abu Ali Ibn Sakan, who's a Hafid of Hadith from Egypt, he takes Bukhari from Farabri, but he doesn't, he doesn't even declare him to be reliable. <laughs> but they're trying to say this should make it reliable. So, people, this is Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi. He has a section in his book, as you can see, page 84 where he says ذكر الحجة على أن رواية الثقة عن غيره ليس تعديلا له 
that taking a, if a scholar transmits from somebody, that does not mean they are declaring them reliable. And he says, احتج من زعم أن رواية العدل غير تعديل له بأن العدل لو كان يعلم فيه جرحا لذكره. He says people say, oh, if the... yeah, but if he's taking from him, if he thought he was doubtful, he would never take from him. Al Khatib al Baghdadi says, هذا باطل. هذا باطل. 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 لأنه لا يجوز أن يكون العدل لا يعرف عدالته فلا تكون رواية عنه تعديلا ولا خبرا عن صدقه. He says that you know, it could be for other reasons. Maybe he just doesn't know. Many people transmit. Imam Malik transmitted from somebody, Abdul Karim uh, Ibn Abdul Makhariq. He transmits from him. He was an unreliable transmit. It doesn't mean just because he transmitted from him that person becomes reliable. That way, every person who Abu Dawood transmitted from, a Tirmidhi transmitted from, Ibn Majah transmitted from, uh, An Nasa'i transmitted from, uh, Ibn Abi Hatim transmitted from, e sorry, Abu Ha, every person Ibn Khuzayma transmitted from, Ibn Hibban transmitted, every person they transmitted from would automatically become thiqa. That's nonsense. And this is the same thing that even uh, Ibn Salah writes in his Muqaddimah as well. He writes the same thing. The same thing Ibn Hajar writes in his commentary on Nukhbat al-Fikr. But I quoted uh, Al-Khatib because he's the earliest out of them. Uh, therefore, perhaps in some ways more authoritative. But they all write the same thing. That, so this one, not nice. you know, Because I saw some people trying to say, well, because people transmit from him, therefore automatically that's ta'adil, he's reliable. Na na na. <laughs> this one, not nice, my friend. This one... This one dubious, you know, this one dubious circumstances. So the second point, right, Ibn Hajar writes in his Fatul Bari, this is page six of the Muqaddimah. Qal al-Imam Abu al-Walid al-Baji, Abu al-Walid al-Baji says from the student of Farabri, he goes with a chain. He says, al-Mustamli, whose name was Abu Ishaq al-Mustamli, he says, Intasakhtu that this uh, istansakhtu that I copied Kitab al Bukhari min asli illadi kana in the sahibihi al Farabri. So I copied my version of Bukhari from uh, Farabri. Faraaitu ashia lam tatim. So I show wa ashia mubayyada. And he says, I saw many things that were in. He says, I saw some things that were still incomplete in Farabri's copy. And he says, and I saw things that were complete. So he had chapter headings which were empty. They had no hadith in them. This is from Fatul Bari, Ibn Hajar. He's quoting uh, Abu Walid al Baji. And he says, and he had some hadith with no chapter heading. And he says, So we started to move them around. What does Baji say? Baji says, He says, what proves this to be true? That Al-Mustamli's copy and Sarakhsi's copy and Kushmehani's copy and Marwazi's copy are all different. So it shows. And he goes on to say, despite them taking from one book, how are they all different? Okay. So, and by the way, Ibn Rushaid is upset about Baji's statement there, the one because he's trying to justify Bukhari so much. So he says, I wish uh, Al-Baji didn't make that comment because Baji kind of questions that how did they, you know, despite all, we're all copying from one book, why have we all got different books? So this is the issue, people. Look, so people that are trying to counter this, they're trying to say, well, no, you know, Farabri, because people took from him, Ibn Sakan took from him. First of all, Ibn Sakan is known for his tasahul in hadith, and I haven't got time, otherwise I would go through them. Um, you can see, actually, Abdullah Sa'ad, the, the famous uh, Salafi scholar, has a, a whole thing on it in his introduction to the ta'aliqa of uh, the ilal of Ibn Abi Hatim. It's very interesting. He goes through several uh, uh, f shortcomings of Ibn Sakan anyway. Uh, who is one of the students of Rabri, but that's not the point, to show that he was mutasahil, he used to just declare people as reliable when they really weren't, but that he hasn't even declared Farabri reliable. And to claim, well, because he transmitted that automatically makes him, then that's not what Khatib 
al-Baghdadi said. That's not what Ibn Salah said. That's not what the Habis, uh, sorry, that uh, Ibn Hajar said. Okay, so that's wrong. Today I read one person write, oh, Ibn Adi wrote a book of weak transmitters and said, I put everybody in here. So if you don't find anybody in here, so if there's any weak transmitter, you're going to find him in there. And because Farabri is not in there, that makes him reliable. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> wow! Man, ge, man, ge, boss. Is this what we've come to in arguing? That is... if you don't find him in that book, he must be reliable. <laughs> oh my god! That is the the most absurd. That is like the most stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> That goes to show how weak it actually is. Why not just be honest? Let's be honest. Then people, the manuscripts amongst themselves disagreed and differed. Uh, they continue the key manuscripts are all through people like Al-Harawi, who takes from the three students of Farabri. Um, and, and, and it's a patchwork. He's patching between these three, between uh, Mustamli, between Sarakhsi, between uh, Al-Kushmehani. And then, by the way, he himself says... Uh, the, the, and you've got another manuscript known as the Karima, which is based on the Kushmehani. But Abu Harawi himself says Kushmehani was not a scholar of Hadith, so I ended up deleting a lot of what he had put in there. Uh, then you've got like, okay, you've got people in Al-Andalus basing it on, uh, uh, what is it, Al-Marwazi, that you've got transmissions like Al-Asili taking Bukhari into Andalus. You've got people after him. Uh, I'm basing it on al Jurjanis as well. Uh, and you've got Al-Qabisi, who's a Maliki scholar. And by the way, Ibn Hajar in his Ijazah is even mistaken here. Uh, Ibn Hajar claims that Qabisi actually had it based on Jurjani, and that was a mistake. He didn't. He only had it on Marwazi. But yes, the Spanish people did have it on. But these are all through Frabri. And they all disagree. And it's not just little disagreements. The actual names in the chains are missing as well. And this continues until... Sudfi is a major source, but then he was re terrible in his handwriting. They say he was Sayy ul Khat and his manuscripts didn't even have dots. So his student actually disagrees with his manuscript massively, Ibn Sa'ada does, and which is the relied upon manuscript in Maghrib today, uh, in the North West African world, Muslim world. So, and then Yunini comes along and does his grant makeover project because he's commissioned and he's a great scholar. I'm not saying his intentions were bad, but he makes huge amendments and he sits with the grammarian Ibn Malik and they then make amendments to the Arabic as well, which shows that, wait a minute, why were there these errors in the first place? So all of these things, then his copy goes missing and we only have copies from his copy, which... Uh, then later on are redone by under the uh, by the commissioning of Sultan Abdul Hamid of the Ottoman Empire the second and even that has several mistakes in it so my point is look can people answer these things and the truth is you can't so what am I ultimately saying what I'm saying to sum that up people is that <coughs> Bukhari we have to look at the claim the claim is that this is the most authentic book on planet Earth for Muslims, putting the Quran aside. On planet Earth, this is the most authentic book. And that is utterly absurd. That is nonsense. That is no way. The whole book really relies on one man who nobody even vouched for. So, in essence... Am I saying, some people have asked, <coughs> am I saying we should throw Sahil Bukhari away? I've not said that. I'm not saying to throw books away. But what I'm saying is this book is suspect. So yes, we can... Look, first of all, we don't need to take our deen from it because our deen has already come from the living tradition. We already have our deen in, as a living tradition. That's been a continuous practice all the way it's inherited through fiqh and madhabs so we don't need to take deen from this because we've already got our deen okay so just to clarify that point the sunnah already reaches us through fiqh people say oh well how will you prove how to pray through fiqh nobody proved it through hadith hadith was documented much after the prophet over 100 to 120 years after the prophet so look our 
practice of Islam comes to us with the Sunnah through Fiqh. So yes, we can look at Bukhari, but just like any other book, it is no different to these other books. It is doubtful. It is nowhere near a solid foundation, but it's okay. It's interesting. I'm not saying it has to be. It's not necessary. I'm not saying everything in there has to be false. But when we look at it, we look at it with three criteria, as scholars like Ibn al Jawzi, Ibn al Hazm, Siyuti, all these people have highlighted. That look, it cannot go against reason, it cannot clash with the Quran, and it cannot uproot Islamic principles. They said the Arabic they used was Lam Yubayin al Ma'qul, wa Lam Yukhalif al Manqul. Al Manqul was the Quran and the established Sunnah that reaches us through fiqh, through the living tradition. Wa Lam Yunaqid al Usul. It does not uproot an Islamic principle. In that case, we can accept it, we can look at it, we can take information, but it must always be, we must recognize this is not certainty. This is dhanni. This is just something conjectural. Like, okay, fine if it helps. If it's part of the spirit of Islam, there's no problem. You know, if it's something saying, look, you should give in charity, you should be kind to people, you should do things, that's fine. You can take that. You can say, look, it's in Bukhari, it's in Muslim, it's in these books. Teach people. If it says something, maybe you'll find something interesting. Oh, that's an interesting point. I never, but it fits in with the narrative. The problem is these, when it brings nonsense, this is a problem. I do wish if only the Muslims earlier on had kind of two things one if they had really filtered this nonsense out of there that would have been amazing or at least if they'd been open courageous to criticize the nonsense for what it is two i am upset at the claim that people keep going on about this is the most authentic book on earth this is the most no it isn't not by any standard it's the most it's it's full of mistakes i mean you can't even prove it's it's it, 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 it reaching us with any kind of comfortable certainty you can't prove it at all so but yes at the same time many books look we've got books in in arabic we've got books in fiqh we've got books in hadith they're all part of our heritage we don't throw them away we're not about throwing books away and yes you can take you can benefit from them but as long as it fits in and we need to lower the kind of expectation of the of what we think is the quality of what we're getting from Sahih al-Bukhari, right? The quality of what we're getting from Sahih al-Bukhari is, in my understanding, just like any other hadith. So when we're getting something from Bukhari, when we're getting something from Ibn Majah behind me, it's hadith, it's hadith. We judge each hadith upon its individual merits. None of this, you know, oh, but it's in Bukhari. And you know, the nonsense is people were saying to me, oh, but we do that anyway. No, you don't. No, you do not. Because be honest, if I had challenged the, the foundations of Ibn Majah, none of you would have batted an eyelid. It's only because of the <coughs> semi-divine status of Sahih Bukhari. They're pre prepared to insult the prophets because it's in Bukhari. You think they would insult the prophets if it was just in Ibn Majah? No way on earth. But Bukhari, they are prepared to throw the messenger under the bus. No love for the Prophet, but just so long as their sect remains happy. That, oh, my sect is not going to be happy if I question Sahih al-Bukhari, so what the hell, I'll just throw the Prophet under the bus. You know, the Prophet's a paedophile, doesn't matter. Oh, but then paedophilia was different. Well, what, 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 are you even listening to yourself? So these are separate, th and you know, this is interesting when I used to criticize chains in Bukhari, as I do often in my Monday nights with Mufti, people used to say, oh my God, this is Sahil Bukhari, this is Sahil Bukhari. Now when I question the foundations, so many scholars told me, why don't you just question the individual chains? That That's okay. <laughs> right? So it's, it's interesting. But that's not why I brought this issue up. I brought this up because I came across it, I investigated it. And I started reading into it and I was shocked that, wow, this is actually, this is actually a problem. So I, all I'm asking is people become more transparent, more honest. And then that way, when you're confronted with this, it won't shake your faith. 
Many people have left Islam because of the nonsense that's been shoved down their throats based on Sahih al-Bukhari. So we've got to be real. We've got to be transparent. Let's not hide things. Let's not pretend. Oh, it's all okay. It's all fine. You know, and then people said to me, why didn't you do a peer review? What peer review? What are you on about? There is no peer, academic, neutral, objective peer review in Muslim circles. It's all bigoted, prejudiced, sectarian. Religion never works as an independent, secular kind of system does. It doesn't work like in universities. And this is the truth. Let's just be honest. People said to me, no, what are you talking about? Of course, they would admit, look, people declare me a deviant just for having different views. These are the people you want me to ask? Oh, what do you think? Of course, they'll never agree. They can't even accept little. I said, oh, women can pluck their eyebrows and people through, through a, a hissy fit. Like, what are you on about? You think these people are going to allow me? I must take their permission to challenge the, the foundations of what, what they almost worship, Sahih al-Bukhari. And a prime example, with, and I, mean, I actually respect I show much love and respect to Dr. Jonathan Brown, but that's a prime example. He is a leading academic who is a, a lecturer and professor at, I think, Georgetown University, who's written uh, academic works and knows how to discuss academically. Yet, when I raised this claim, it was nothing but an emotional response. You know, oh, Mufti doesn't even know how to say these Maliki names. Now look at this. That, you know, I actually showed that this Bunani, there were 14 scholars, popular scholars by that name. These guys don't even know that. They, they wouldn't even know that. They, they wouldn't even know five. They wouldn't even know three. And it was actually Bunani. It wasn't even Bunani. So why make a big deal trying to show? You see, this is to belittle. These are the same tactics that just to show that, oh, this guy is really dumb and stupid. He doesn't even know his Arabic. <laughs> I used to sit with some of the dons of Arabic in their time. Sheikh Abdul Ghani al Dikar, in his age, uh, in, uh, in the late 90s, was one of the most knowledgeable people on earth in Arabic grammar. He, was, he received awards from the Arabic world. He received awards from Saudi. Uh, he was deemed by people, A'lamun Nas bi Kitabi Sibawai, that the most knowledgeable of people on the book of Sibawai. I used to sit, I used to have a good banter with him actually. I used to regularly, every day, sit. Very few people used to be there. In fact, nobody used to be there uh, in the masjid at that time. He used to come very early. He was an old man. He used to have a huge banter. He used to love the fact that I was Maliki and I was of Pakistani origin. He, he'd never heard of that. And so we used to always go on. And I used to tell him my research in grammar because I, at that time I was obsessed about grammar. Arabic grammar, and I used to tell him that, what do you think of Sibawe said this about the, you know, when it came to what is now known as the Muqtada and Khabar, and don't you find a clash in this, or what about the concept of Ibtida, doesn't it have problematic when, uh, doesn't it have problems with trying to say there's an, uh, there's Awamil that don't exist, or don't you think about this, and don't you think, and he used to find it very fascinating, I mean, obviously he, he was a don in this stuff, but so don't, you know, trying to belittle, oh, my knowledge on these things. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't, you know, that <laughs> you underestimate me, you know. <laughs> this one, Bahut Bain Safi So this is why, so this is the thing that these people were saying, have an academic dialogue with these people. And I extended a dialogue. I extended a dialogue to Sheikh Yasser Khadi. I said, have a dialogue with me. I extended it to Dr. Jonathan Brown. I said, have a dialogue with me. He said, I won't have a dialogue on this topic. I'll discuss other topics. I said, but, but you're discussing this topic on social media. <laughs> I mean, I don't get what. And pe then people said, why did you go public with this? What do you mean, why did I go public? Who, who, why should I hide this? They're like, yeah, but this is going to create a fitna. Why is it going to create a fitna? Why? Why? It's the truth, isn't it? You want me to... So basically what you're saying is... I understand there's problems, but shh. <laughs> don't tell them. Let's pretend there's no problem. But that's ridiculous. This is where the problems come from. You're doing it right now. This is the problem. If we were just honest from the beginning, people wouldn't lose their faith. 
I, you know, I've spoken to many Muslims who, some who are ex-Muslims and some who are borderline, they may have left and come back because of what was shoved down their throat based on this grand claim of the most authentic book on earth. So this attitude of let's hide things from the common Muslim, I'm so against that. Like why? And I said, look, oh, would you have an issue with me writing a book and publishing it? They said, no. I said, but isn't a book for the public? So the public can read a book, but what? They can't read social media. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, the totally dumb people don't read uh, <laughs> books. I thought, yes, you know, and you guys are the clergy. What's wrong with you? Why are you so judgmental? Why are you so, why do you have to infantilize people, like treat them like idiots? But then you have no problem. They have no problem broadcasting that the prophet married a six-year-old little girl. And they think that's not problematic. In fact, after my debate on Bukhari, I saw several scholars share that. Several prominent, you know, uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown came with this article about a chart showing that Aisha was six years old. And, and then several of them shared it as, as somehow as a kind of slap in the face for me. And I felt like, well, that's not irresponsible trying to show that the prophet was a paedophile. And you and you think this is irresponsible, me trying to show that, well, just being honest, that you can't actually prove this to, to go back beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, you can have guesswork and yeah, there's been variations, but there isn't that comfort of mind. It, it isn't there. So, you know, that that kind of tranquility isn't there in it being uh, sound beyond reasonable doubt. So, yeah, so this is some of the um, of the, the kind of criticism. Guys, it's gone on so long. Ever so sorry, but I know so many people were asking me about this. I've asked to debate them. I've asked to debate them on this. Uh, about the age of Aisha, inshallah, I will, I will reach out and I will take that up. The reason I didn't first immediately jump at that is because I kept insisting. I said, I said to Dr. Jonathan Brown, I will debate you on the, I'll have a dialogue with you on the age of Aisha. Can we in the same dialogue, in the first part, discuss the authenticity of Bukhari? Because that includes the age of Aisha and not vice versa. And the second part, we will within the same dialogue, we can move on to the age of Aisha. Uh, but he said no. He was adamant. I asked him on several occasions repeatedly, please, because you seem very learned and people, you know, they keep referring to, back to you and you're sharing all these charts. Let's have a dialogue on. So, okay, he wants it. Uh, I think he's agreeable to it on the age of Aisha. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> Let's see how I smash these chains to pieces. Allah, Allah, Allah. Or oh, as the poet, uh, John Elia, who I've been <laughs> rather fond of, he says, Ilaj to ye hai ke main majboor kar diya jau. See, the solution to countering me is that you crush me. <laughs> he says, Ilaj to ye hai ke main majboor kar diya jau. Varna yuhi to kisi ki nahi suni hai mein. <laughs> otherwise, on my otherwise left to my own devices, I've never succumbed to anyone. <laughs> so if you want to crush my arguments, by all means, that's the only solution you've got. Ilaj to ye hai ke majboor kar diya jaun. Varna yuhi to kisi ki nahi suni hai mein. So people with that, much love. Inshallah, I'm gonna leave you guys to it. You've been awesome. Wow, I've really stretched this today. So sorry about that, but I really thought this was really important. People kept saying you're not showing references. You're not showing references. So I thought, oh, okay, what the hell? Let's so let's show some at least. Inshallah. So let's. <sighs> it's quite an evening. That's what I'll say. Inshallah. People, if you're new to my page, like it. Uh, if uh, likewise with YouTube, I do release clips all the time. Subscribe to it. Um, you can send me messages on both my pages on Facebook. You can follow. Um, I'm on Twitter, Snapchat, Mount 2014. Other than that, people take very good care of yourselves. See you all next week. Much love, inshallah, inshallah. Till then, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh.